Hey everybody, John here from the Pastor Discussions Podcast. This week in episode 41, we finally get to the issue of social justice. Uh, we interact a little bit with the statement on social justice and what Al Mohler had to say, but a bulk of the conversation today is really talking about this issue in general and some observations and things that we're seeing uh, among Christians in particular in talking about this issue of social justice. So let us know what you think. Send us an email, pastordiscussions at gmail.com. And uh, thanks for listening. We really appreciate you guys. Episode 41 of the Pastor Discussions podcast starts now. He has wiped out by his grace through faith in Christ your every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. You are now listening to the Pastor Discussions Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 41 of the Pastor Discussions Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Joe, and this is your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. This is the first time that we've gotten together and actually recorded together in, like <laughs> in person a, a in month. like two weeks. I think it's been longer than two weeks because we had maybe three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. It's been a while. That's <laughs> so we've had, we've had a lot happen since the last recording. Yeah, it's been really, really busy. Yeah, we um, had, uh, let's see, we had the Cultivate Conference. Yeah. And we got to meet Chris. Yeah. Uh, that was, he He wrote a blog article. Did you see that? About the, About conference. the conference? Yeah, yeah that. that was really cool. Um, we did that. That was really good, actually. I heard there were a lot of, uh, We're side note, we're going to have the, we recorded the sessions from Brian. And then out sessions. So we're going to have those as future podcast episodes for everybody. Uh, but Brian was really helpful. That was really good. Yeah, I heard a lot, a lot of people say that it was probably the most um, beneficial as far as practical help and just encouraging for it. It was small, so it was only about yeah. 100 people. But um, I think it was, yeah, agreed. I thought it was really helpful and really good. When Brian said something uh, really interesting, he said he actually prefers smaller things like that because he gets to sit down and talk with people and, yeah. and hear their stories and stuff. So that was really cool. And then let's see, Carly was gone for a week <laughs> and in 10 days. Don't, 10 don't days. cut yourself short yeah. there. <laughs> and I survived. Um, it was actually, it was, that was really, it was really good. Like we missed Carly and everything, but it, Ainsley, our youngest has always been a mama's girl. And so it was kind of good bonding time for the two of us. So now she doesn't have her kid though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Finley's already your kid. So Mom, mom's got to have one stealing my children away from my wife. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, that's, and then it's just been a, it's been a busy week. we got the youth thing coming up this weekend, which I'm really pumped about. <laughs> I'm, my, my inner child is, is coming out. I, I think it'll be a lot of fun too. So Anyway, uh, we're part of the Bark Podcast Network. You can get more great biblical content for your ear holes by going to thebarpodcast.com. And if you're a coffee drinker, check out resurrectioncoffeeco.com. They've got some excellent coffee that we highly recommend. Finley was drinking out of a uh, a tumbler that I have that has a Resurrection Coffee Co. sticker on it. And uh, it was it was juice. It was like cider. But... <laughs> Still, she was representing, representing for them. So, uh, so yeah. And then, uh, is there anything else we need to handle? Oh yeah. 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 The design contest. We're doing the design contest. Yeah. I was going to say all the, uh, the PDP gear. Yeah. PDP gear. Uh, so close. PDP gear, PDP gear, PDP gear there. Um, anyway, go to pastor discussions.com forward slash gear and you can get your pastor discussions gear. We've got some stuff for fall. Now some hoodies because I'm excited about hoodie weather. I love yeah, hoodie weather. I, I do love fall, although it's kind of gotten. It feels like it early spring. Yeah, like it's all rainy and dreary and yeah, and kind of cold. So, but we're running a design contest. So if you if you listen last week, we had uh, Jimmy Needham on talking about creativity. Exercise your creativity and design a logo for us for a shirt or sweater or something like that. And if we pick your design, we'll give you a free shirt. So you can enter that. You can send your entries into pastor discussions at gmail.com. 
And uh, just remember, if you want a transparent background, make sure it's got a transparent background PNG file. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but if you're doing it, I'm sure you do. So. All right. So uh, we, we delayed this. Yeah. So three weeks ago, yeah, three. we sent out. Uh, <laughs> we promised we would talk about it like in two weeks. So we're only a, we're only a week off. I That's think. not too so. bad for us. Yeah. That's so. pretty good, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's social justice. This is a big buzzword right now. So we we played uh, a clip for an episode, which was more than a clip. It was like a it was, was like a, a whole sermon. Yeah. It was, this was <laughs> Moeller just um just explaining his thoughts off of one question. Yeah, on social justice, which was interesting to I listen I've listened to it three or four times mm-hmm. now, and just been trying to think through some of what he said. Um, I've not read the statement in full, but I've read um, portions of it, um, mm-hmm. kind of the portions that um, guys like Mueller and Keller are are highlighting as their mm-hmm. big issues with it. So um, I think it'll be an interesting conversation. Then we had some comments that we're going to um, talk through as well. So Yeah, so why don't you start off and just talk to me about uh, Mueller and Keller and their comments and your thoughts on that. So one of the big things with, with both of them is um, – I think two things, people who read this will um, not understand because some of the terms have not been defined within the statement. Okay. Um, I think, so I think those are are legitimate. And um, one of the things I think that Moeller had said was that people will take that and they'll read it in their, um, they'll read it through their own lens, through their own worldview, and they'll come to a different conclusion than what the statement is is trying to point at. Um, that was one of his critiques of it. Now, while I agree with what he's saying, can people not do that with everything? Yeah. Like Mueller could write a book that's everything exactly how he thinks it should be. And somebody could grab that book and read it and come to completely different conclusions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have this issue with everything we have it, especially with reading scripture where we read it through our own lens um, without with our own preconceptions and sometimes put ourselves into a place where we shouldn't and we, we do an eisegesis instead of an exegesis, which is the same thing that both these guys are talking about with with their issues with this thing. So my question back to them would have been, not that I could actually ask them a question, but... Oh yeah, Mueller, <laughs> if you're listening. But how is that any different than anything else that, that we as Christians are going to put out? And I get the reason they're saying it is because this is such a hot button issue right now. And right. this really seems to be just one of those things where the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth. Yeah. And we're reacting to things that are going on in our culture. So that was one of the big things that that stood out that I kind of disagreed with. And then um, the other one um, that with them that I disagree with them. Now, the other thing that they were really talking about is there's kind of a uh, there is there's um, the victims of real uh, social injustice Mm -hmm. are not being uh, recognized within the statement. The statement is almost putting down. Um, vic- that there are real victims. Yeah, let me get the exact uh, entitled victims of oppression. You're right. I think is that's the how the statement uh, in the statement. Uh, and there needs to be a distinction. And this is where I think words really matter. And they and they actually, I think, maybe did a poor job within the statement. Is there are there's a there's a victimization culture, mm-hmm. but there are real victims. Yeah. Um. If we have a worldview of a gospel worldview, part of that worldview is we live in a world that's marred by sin. Right. And with that comes issues of of oppression and people who um, are taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. So to to say that without acknowledging that there are real victims, when people read that, maybe that part of the statement wasn't thought through well enough. Yeah. Um. I would say that I don't think the statement is, is ignoring that there are, but they're not doing a good job of Aff- affirming yeah. that, that there are real victims that are more attacking the, where our culture is going. Yeah. you So you can tell that this statement on social justice is very much a reaction right. to cultural issues that are going on. 
And I just don't think as believers, we should just be reacting to cultural things. Okay, fine. We want to react. I'm good with that. But where's the grounding that, and Mueller did a good job of pointing this out, that we've been dealing with this exact issue because it's a sin issue for a lot longer than the last five, six years. Yeah. Well, and even a lot longer than America has been around. Right. You know, the, the, this, and, and okay. So there's, you, you said a couple of things. So let's go back to the first one. Um, I think one of the takeaways for me from what you were saying just a minute ago is the importance of clearly defining our terms. So even the term social justice, um, I've been, I've been thinking about this and I've heard some, I've read some things from some other people and I think there's a really compelling argument to be made that there, that, that there is justice and then there is injustice. And that might play itself out in a social setting or in a cultural setting, but the idea even of social justice sort of divorces our idea of justice from it being rooted and grounded in God's character and what he ordains as just. Okay. And I would agree with that, but what tends to happen is the social aspect, because there is an aspect of justice that has to do with the society, with the social issues. Right. And God doesn't ignore that, those things. Exactly. But we tend to say, well, let's just ignore that part of it because justice is going to happen. And I agree with that. Eventually, justice is going to play itself out. God is perfectly just and he's going to work those things out um, either in this life or the next, definitely in the next. So we tend to not worry about some of the social uh, issues. Right. But here, here's my point. My point is that we should be focusing on justice that has social implications, not adopting the language of social justice, which has been hijacked, which I think is contributing to some of the confusion in terms. You see what I'm saying? So by saying we've already got a, a big, these, all these social, social justice warriors and all this other garbage. Um, we've got, these people that have used the term social justice, and then we've got a statement on social justice. And so what we're doing is we're, we're interacting with, we're letting, we're letting the culture define the terms rather than saying, okay, we uphold justice. Justice is defined as uh, being rooted in God's character and revealed in God's word. Right. And that has social implications for how we treat one another that flesh themselves out under the authority of the word of God. So in response, instead of responding to the, just the very small. Yeah. The one aspect. Justice, yes. No, let's respond to what justice really should look like and the implications on our society. Exactly. Because let's, of that. Justice. Let's help the culture think through the issue of justice in a way that's helpful for them outside of the scope of maybe some of the social implications of that. Right. And that, that goes back to having a gospel worldview though. Yeah. So if, if your, if your worldview and your view on justice is not one that's rooted in what, um, in God's justice and what scripture says real justice looks like, that was one of the things I I came away with is like, why are we always trying to fix the issues of our society with, um, societal, um, like we don't, we don't remedies, right. Remedies. We don't come back to. We let politics, like we see all these political issues and mm-hmm. we think politics are going to fix these political issues yeah. as believers. And it's such a a wrong way to go about these things. If we really are gospel-centered people and a gospel-transformed community, then shouldn't we see these issues in the world and the uh, remedies for these issues is found in the message of the gospel and not in well, we'll leave this here and we'll talk about politics and we'll set up all these systems and these rules to try to address all these other issues. And the problem is that even we could come up with the best thing ever and it's still going to be marred by people mm-hmm. and who are running it who have the same sin issues that we have as – um not sin issues that we have. I want to be, you got on me about saying we had a sin nature <laughs> one time, but, but we're still marred by sin. So we still, we put people in place who aren't believers, who don't look at the world um, through a gospel lens. Mm-hmm. And we expect it to actually have real change on our culture. And that's never actually going to create change that's going to last. Right. So, but there's also another aspect to that though, which is like, I think it's Romans 14, which talks about the, the 
authorities being in place by God to wield the sword. And so there is a responsibility, I think, of government to pursue justice um, as best it can as a agent and representative of God, even though they might not know God. And and the the question then becomes like, what is the role of Chris, of the Christian in that? I think, and and I think this is where some of this stuff hits the road because what what we should be advocating for, and this sort of maybe ties together what I was saying before, we should be advocating for you know justice to be served for all people, and justice is defined by God, and the the state should be pursuing as best it can justice for all people. So I don't have a problem with people saying that there are um, certain groups of people that have experienced uh, uh, injustice based on their race or based on, because that's a fact. Um, The solution needs to be, all right, like the, like the 1968, uh, um, civil rights movement where, uh, Linda B. Johnson, uh, signed a bill into law that, uh, that, that allowed for African Americans to have, uh, civil liberties and rights that they had been denied. I think that's a good thing for the, for the state to do. And I think it was a good thing for people to be advocating for that. And in the same vein though, Ultimately, we need to recognize that that's not going to fix the problem. The problem with racism is not an issue of people are being denied certain rights. The problem with racism is that I have a wicked heart that views other people that God has made in his image and made differently um, than me as inferior or having less value or less worth. And therefore, I treat them as though they are subhuman or they don't have the same rights that I do. So that's the balance I think between what, and, and that's, what's getting lost. Exactly. And, and, and what's happening is we're taking the cultural cues and we're going over the top with rhetoric. And anybody who doesn't agree with the statement on social justice is a Marxist and, um, anybody, some, some camps. Yeah. In some camps. Okay. But it's it's like what, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're polarizing around an issue Rather than, okay, like, I, and I think, like, I think that this statement was an attempt to try to unify some people around, around how to deal with this and try to help people think through how to deal with this. I just think, I think Moeller has some valid criticisms of that. And, and I think it's a step, like he said, but I don't think it's the final solution for that. I think ultimately what we need to recognize is we need to recognize that we should not hope in politics, but we should we we have a vested interest in our country because of the way it's created to pursue um, people for office that will uh, deal justly and ensure uh, justice is done. But our hope isn't in that. And, and therein lies the, the, the part that I think we're missing, which is every individual Christian has a responsibility to share the gospel and the gospel is what deals with the issues that cause injustice. Right. And, so, and I think that's what is that, is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah, I think like, so we don't focus on the thing that transformed the message that transformed that we've been called to proclaim. Like if we're a transformed people as a church, then the church is not going to come out of, look at this, at these issues and say, well, we can, fix these issues with uh, more laws or more politics. And it, what we tend to do is we get frustrated, especially uh, people that are Republican or conservative with the way society is going. And instead of going back to we, these people need the gospel. They need to see transformed communities live out what the conversion that's happened if conversion happens, transformation happens. And if you've got a transformed community, that's what's going to have an impact on the culture. Mm-hmm. It's not, we, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying about government, okay. but 
believers re- rely on the government to make the yes. change that the gospel is the only thing that can agree can make that change. So my my biggest issue is we we get distracted by things like social justice and now that we're distracted by this statement on social justice and we're arguing about it amongst ourselves instead of living out the reality of our conversion and the transformation that's happened so that we can actually go and combat issues like social justice with the gospel versus, well, okay, we're going to write a statement about this. Mm -hmm. Does that statement cloud the gospel to people? Absolutely. It does to people who disagree with it. And now these arguments that are coming back, all we're, all the people that are looking from the outside are seeing is infighting mm-hmm. because we get hung up on definition of terms or uh, this aspect of the social gospel of the of the culture of victimization that's happening. That's true. And at the same time, we ignore all the real victims. The gospel doesn't ignore those victims. And the gospel also addresses the uh, victimization culture. Yeah. So I don't like, I I, I don't know. I I think a big part of the problem though, is that for like, so I came from a Southern Baptist seminary. Southern Baptists have had this stain of racism that's been on them for a long time. And I think that there's some overcorrections. Like there's some people that are overcorrecting and like, Hey, we need to, um, like, like my generation, like, I don't need to apologize for things my great grandfather did. In my opinion, I I had nothing to do with that. I wasn't alive. Um, What I need to do is I need to let the gospel influence my own heart and my own thinking and my, and my life and live in light of the gospel. And, and I think that part of the problem is that in, in, in some in some ways, we as a as the church, as the American church, still struggle with letting the gospel influence how we think of people that are different than us. I agree. I, I agree think that that's that. a massive issue that has been left untalked about for a long time. So Chris Hughes wrote us um, and was talking about how when he was a kid, he he wanted to invite uh, some friends of his to a youth event, and. Uh, they were, uh, they were black kids and the deacon, and this is what he said. The deacon took issue with that, telling me that they in quotes will not be allowed to come in the doors of the church. If I wanted to go evangelize them, I could because they needed saving, but I was not to bring them to our church, both in quotes. Um, so he said, uh, now where, where was he? This was, uh, where was this? Um, Georgia. Yeah. And, and so, uh, he said, uh, I've seen, or maybe he was a, oh, it was his first pastorate. He wasn't a kid. It was his first pastorate. Um, and he said, anyway, he said, uh, I've seen racism like nobody's business and yet no, uh, not one of, uh, I'm sorry, I'll move this so I can see it. And yet not one of those parents or deacons would ever consider themselves racist or prejudice. Um, and he says, uh, that this is that that this spirit is alive and well in the church, and I think he's I think he's got a great point there, because there is there there's racism that's masked as theology. I've heard people say that there's like the the curse of Cain, and that's why black people were slaves. And I'm like that is the worst theology I could. That's, that's that's horrible. Like stop that right now. That's sin, and what we have not done as the church is we have not done a good job of guarding the Imago Dei, the, the, the fact that we're all created in God's image. We have not done a good job of welcoming people that are not like us and seeing that gospel transformation take place in their lives. And so the world looks at this and they're, they're, they're looking at it and they're, they're like, okay, well, yeah, well, what do they have to offer? So the world, I would say yes. And I agree with you on the race thing. I think I think there's some, there's some inherent just racial issues that we, and um, racial temptation that as Christians, we've got to, we've got to kill, we've got to kill that sin off in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, I think. And it's not one-sided either. I want to be clear about that. Like racism is not one-sided. We often, when we hear racism, we think 
uh, white people are racist against some minority. And that's just not true. Like right. there's racism that goes both ways. Right. So it's, it's not just a, a problem with one race. I agreed. Um, and, but I, what I'm saying is I think for us, for any believer to deny that they don't struggle with that in some shape or form, like, especially as Americans, um, we see people coming into our country right now, especially Hispanic people. Mm-hmm. And you get around one who can't speak English and there's an immediate like frustration that's building up in you that why is this person in my, in this country if he can't speak our language? Yeah. He's just ruining our country. And we see that in large part in the conservative community. And mm-hmm. I get it that there's there's issues that they've come in illegally and they don't they don't have to pay taxes and blah 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 and you could go on and on. And not and that's not all of them either. Like there's some people that have genuinely come into the country the right way and struggle to learn the language. Right. So we tend to lump them all together. That I really believe that's a form of racism that's that's deep seated in us that we need to work at killing off. It's nationalism that overrides our our gospel allegiance. Right. You know, so, it's like I'm American first. So the race thing I think is legitimate. But what like w- there's another issue there with with homosexuality, with the transgender movement with the feminist movement that are all part of this social injustice um, conversation. So how we struggle to see those people also as image bearers of God, true as conservative uh, Christians. So how do we, how do we interact with that within this, this context? Well, we don't, we keep trying to construct, why are we so worried about, um, homosexual marriage i think there's there's a reason that we should be concerned about it as christians Mm -hmm. but are the main reasons that we should be concerned about it is because we're concerned for the souls of those people or is it because of the social implications that it has on our society and we don't want to um we don't want to serve those people because we think less of them because they're homosexual so we think less of them being image bearers of God. So I think that there's a, like some of this, some of this can be apples and oranges in some sense. So when we're talking about uh, like homosexuality and implications for that, we're talking about a basic undermining of God's design for humanity in relationships of marriage. But, but don't you see that at its core, we see those people and we see them as less valuable. And instead we see the color of their skin or the orientation that they're choosing um, even and rejecting God's, the natural creation and God's order. And we automatically see them as less valuable. Yeah. I think that can happen. And I think that my point though, is like we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, well, but again, there's where defining terms is important. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what I see is a complete devaluing of a people who need the gospel. Right. And instead of taking the gospel to them, we put up these barriers and we say, let's put political rules uh, in place that keeps them from um, continuing in sin. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's maybe that's the core of it. But instead of, Instead of doing that, would it not be better to go and build relationships with those people so that we can actually share the gospel and give them the life saving message, the thing that they need? Yeah. And and my only point, my only point in that, though, is just maybe a clarification point is we can uphold biblical values and we can uphold a biblical standard of marriage as defined by the Bible and still do that other thing. Those two are not mutually exclusive. They've become mutually ex- exclusive in our culture, by and large. I think that I think that the 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 issue there is we've allowed. I, th- I think you're right. We've allowed a devaluing of those people from a standpoint of being human, and and we viewed them as less than human in in a lot of cases. Uh, yet at the same time, um. I don't know. There's just a tension there because like the, the issue. All, of, all we want to do is point out their sin and never give them the message that helps them to overcome their sin. Yeah, I agree. 
I agree with that. And I think that the, the weakness then is with the, with the, the church and dealing with that case is not upholding a biblical standard of, uh, morality in terms of God's design for men and women. The issue is number one, maybe how that's communicated. And number two, uh, the implications of what we do beyond that. In, in going to those people, in building relationships with those people, in sharing the gospel with those people. Um, so I, I guess, I don't know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to process through that because I, I think that we've, we, we do, we are called to uphold the truth of God and we can point to scripture and show that marriage is a one man, one woman union. But then at the same time, like we've talked about many times, we don't view somebody who's an adulterer with that same kind of disdain as someone who is practicing homosexuality. And, and they've both uh, violated God's design for sexuality. And so I think that there, there's a double standard there. Um, but I also don't think that you need to say, well, we shouldn't be concerned with whether or not gay marriage is, we shouldn't make it a non-issue. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Uh, right. And I wasn't arguing for it to be made a non-issue. I'm arguing for there's an inconsistency in the things that we approach. And this is, this goes back to social injustice. So we look at the social injustice um, warriors, as you like to call them, and what are a lot of them advocating? Uh, women's rights, mm-hmm. some of the f- movement on the feminist side. LGBT is a big part of this, mm-hmm. along with race. Mm-hmm. So all these all these issues are tied into this social injustice thing. And how many of us are, how many of the guys who signed that document or wrote that document were thinking about those specific instances? And this is to where I think Keller and and Mueller are right in that you are closing doors to share the gospel with certain people who need the gospel, who need the missional work that is being done around the globe. They need it here. Mm -hmm. And by putting out a statement like this, uh, instead of having face-to-face interactions or having a dialogue with someone is closing doors. And we do this all the time within the church. We close our doors to people who are different than us Mm -hmm. and people who struggle with sin. Well, we don't look at the sins that we struggle with in the same light as the sins that they struggle with. Yeah. But they're in this need of the same savior that we were in need of as at one point in time. Yeah. So and, the, the and, missing that, and that homosexuality or that transgenderism or the race or whatever other the feminism keeps us. We put up these barriers and say they're not worth saving because they're not like me. Mm-hmm. It's the same core issue with race that happens with homosexuality, transgenderism. Um, there's other there's others. Um, maybe a political party, same mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. It's the same core issue. They're not like me. It's an idolatry of self and what I think. And we start to say, well, no, it's it's a gospel issue. Mm-hmm. It's a gospel issue. They're attacking the gospel. Maybe in some, some form they are, but how do we, how is it always that it comes across as we're devaluing people? Yeah. By putting out statements like this instead of taking the gospel message to them. Yeah. Well, and I, I think the, the, the challenge with the statement on social justice is I, I think it really comes down to some of the language that was, that was used. Like, I think that Moeller's point that I don't understand what they meant by some of these things is really helpful in understanding why he didn't sign it because he said that he, he agreed with large swaths of it. Right. And I was reading it and I found myself agreeing with large swaths of it as well. And then you read it and, and you kind of like, well, what do they mean by that? Does that, because like you were saying, the words that we use have implications for how we, how people um, receive stuff. Right. And so, yeah, I, I like I, I I agree with that. Josh Hart wrote this. I appreciate Al Mohler and respect the heck out of him and everything he does. When I got to the top, uh, when I got on the topic of social justice, I found myself agreeing with everything he was saying. Then he got up, and then he got to the why he didn't sign the statement on social justice and the gospel, uh, and began to talk about language used in the statement that he didn't agree with. 
He brought up the term entitled victims and then began to speak about victims of injustice, but seemed to miss the emphasis on entitled. Nobody has said that there aren't victims of any kind of injustice in this fallen world, and nobody claims as Christians that we shouldn't be living holy lives to help fix the issues of injustice whenever possible. That should be a result of righteous, uh, righteous living and faith that produces works of righteousness. So I don't understand the points that Moeller was trying to get at when he got on the topic. Like Joseph, who had every right to be an entitled victim, he should, or we should all understand that no matter our cultural understanding or ethnicity or gender, God places us in the life of, or in this life for his glory, and we aren't entitled to play the victim ever, really. At least that's how I understand the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ affects us. Maybe you guys could expound on that issue and get into the exact language used in the statement, even that specific example, and expound on it. So I, that's where I was saying I, yeah. I kind of differed with them because words do matter. And they don't ever say there aren't victims, but they don't ever say that there there are. Let me pull this up because I think like. And so there's a, there's a, that lack of acknowledgement of. Of the, which Mueller used the victimization culture versus real victims, and all the focus is on the culture and the things that um, we disagree with, instead of acknowledging that there are real victims. So here's what the statement says: We reject any teaching that encourages racial groups to view themselves as privileged oppressors or as entitled victims of oppression. While we are to weep with those who weep, we deny that a person's feelings of offense or oppression necessarily prove that someone else is guilty of sinful behavior, oppression, or prejudice. So here's here's the issue with that, okay? Um, We reject any teaching that encourages racial groups to view themselves as privileged oppressors or entitled victims of oppression. We get hung up on entitled or privileged, those two words. I don't think those words were necessary at all. Um, because the issue here is like when we talk about entitled victims, here's, here's how I'm thinking about this. If there is, as, as Moeller talked about systematic, uh, abuses of, of power and oppression of specific groups of people, entitled victim to me means that they're entitled to the same rights and justice that everyone else is entitled to. You see what I'm saying? So when I read entitled victim, they are entitled to some stuff. They're entitled to the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that all the rest of us are. They're entitled to being dealt with justly. They're entitled to uh, not being pulled over because of the color of their skin since they specifically talked about racial groups here. Um, They're entitled to being able to get a job without discrimination because of you know, you see what I'm saying? So there is an entitlement aspect there. That's where I'm saying we need to define terms because if entitled means I should get uh, government subsistence for things that happened 300 years ago, yeah, I disagree with that. But if if entitled means that I have a right to this and I'm, I want this to be recognized and it's true, then yes, I think they are entitled. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I still like how, why is all the focus like this on race reaction. Well, or, but this is always a, it's a reactionary statement instead of, okay, here's the state, here's something that's happening. Let's make a doctrinal statement. That's not a reaction to what's going on in society. Let's actually make one that says there are there people who are taking advantage of the system and people are hearing their voice. They're taking advantage of the culture that we live in. And this is, this is a movement that's moving forward and it shouldn't be. Yes. But should we not also as Christians who care about every I'm about lost to turn your soul, volume down on your microphone here. You're getting. <laughs> actually, I don't think you do because I normally come through quieter than you. Should we not care about every lost soul and including the ones that have been victimized? Yes. Um, by our society. Like. Where, where's the state, where's the part of the statement that speaks on that? Yeah. It's not there. Um, so I actually like why I disagree with, um, Moeller and Keller's statements on, well, people can take this the wrong way. Yeah. 
people can take anything the wrong way. That's that's part of the that's just part of human nature um, and reading ourselves into things and our experiences um, playing into that. You're never going to get away from that. But the statement, I don't think if they were going to sit down and write that, why wouldn't you write something that has more breadth in it than just these narrow examples of cultural current social injustice? Yeah. Versus, OK, let, let's 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 expand on this and, and say what we really mean. So there's no room for confusion or no room for needing to define terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that that's. Man, so much of this comes down to the way that that Christianity has melded into politics. Um, you know, it's for the idea that we're a Christian nation, well, and, and still holding on to that, it's like I, I think you, were you and I talking about that that the idea that somehow we think that um, our nation will prosper. Um, it never will because nobody takes into account that man's not good. Yeah. Yeah. So like the entire, yeah, we were talking about this, this was, uh, we were talking about, uh, they, this is at an elder breakfast. Yeah. yeah that's we, right. we were talking about, um, the, the constitution. We were talking about the, Ka- the Kavanaugh. Ka- yeah. Thing. The Kavanaugh thing. And, and constitution, like we're, we were given a Republic. We were not given a democracy and everybody keeps calling it a democracy. And, uh, <clears throat> t- uh, not Thomas Jefferson, um, Benjamin Franklin, when they came out of the con- uh, the continental Congress, the constitutional convention, they came out and this woman asked him, what kind of government did you give us, sir? And he said, we gave you a Republic. If you can keep it, and the Republic is built, both Republic and democracy are built on certain presuppositions. And one of the major influences on the American government is the enlightenment and the enlightenment teaches that everyone is basically good. And given the right situations, mankind will thrive and there will be this utopian society because, uh, everybody's basically good. And what we're seeing is we're seeing the, the, um, that that is inconsistent with the depravity of humanity because man is not basically good. And when given the ability to do what man wants, what we've seen is a decline over the years and we're just, it's getting steeper and steeper and steeper because we uphold these, <clears throat> these personal values and personal liberties. And, and what we've done as, as American Christians is we have identified more with the conservative party um, and, and we've become very individualistic and we've become uh, capitalistic to a point of fault where it's like we are unconcerned with the poor. We are unconcerned with the marginalized. We are unconcerned with the outcast. And, and that's where the, the Democratic Party, for whatever, whatever faults they may have in the way that they execute it, there is a concern for that. They, there, there might be ulterior motives. I get it. There's a lot of stuff playing into that. But as Christians, we should be concerned with what God is concerned about. And if you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament and the law in uh, in uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there is a specific concern for the poor and the marginalized and the outcast and the sojourner and the stranger and the foreigner. And part of Israel's problem was they became so nationalistic that they, that they did not care for the outcast. They did not care for the sojourner. They did not care for the stranger among them. Like they were called to do because that reflects God's character and heart for lost people and marginalized people and hurting people. And, and that's part of the problem in this is we've so conflated conservative politics with American Christianity that they're almost indistinguishable from one another. And what I'm arguing is biblical Christianity has an even balance of concern for the lost, concern for the poor, concern for the hurting, concern for the marginalized, and a um a, there is a personal liberty, a personal um rights type of thing, but it's it's leveled. It's not some people have it, some people don't. It's if you have it, you should be concerned about those that don't have it type of thing. Does that make sense? Right. I, I yeah, I agree. I my point was that the America was built on an idea that man is basically good. Yeah. And that's contrary 
to the gospel. It's contrary to what we, it's one of the aspects of the gospel is the fall is sin. Mm -hmm. And if we think that our nation somehow is exempt from that, which is what a lot of conservative people want it to be. We should be a Christian nation. We should have conservative values. Are you not in some ways rejecting the reality of the fall of man? Mm -hmm. And therefore you're, you in, in one way are abusing the gospel. Yeah. Like that's, this statement I think is in some ways doing that. How can we not expect some of these things to have happened if if we if we rightly see our state as fallen people even in a a republic that was created around uh good values and good morals the the depravity of man is going to overtake that mm -hmm. and it's it's like we don't we don't make that connection as american christians yeah so well I, and one one final thing that that i wanted to highlight is uh, this, this, the way you view this issue has a, is very influenced by your geography. Yeah, that's um, very true. So w we live in Nebraska and it's 98% white, something like that. Um, <clears throat> we did, uh, we recently did a Sunday school, uh, series on unity and diversity in the church. And one of the points that was made is when you live in a culture that is, heavily one way it's very easy to have invisible people and to not see the marginalized to not see the hurting to not see the outcast because well, you insulate yourself from that and then yeah then when we see them we don't think that's actually a reality exactly and and so the the one thing that i would say that that moeller brought up is in in certain parts of our country this is a massive issue yeah in certain parts of our country it's really not that big of an issue you know, you, you, what, what you can't do is you can't say, well, because I don't deal with that here, it's not an issue. And, and also what you can't do on the flip side of that is because it is an issue there. It's an say issue that everywhere. It's an issue everywhere. Exactly. Because, and that, that's where there's that complete imbalance and the extremes on each Everything side. just needs to be balanced with this thing. So like we can at the same time affirm that there is injustice that needs to be rectified, that needs to be addressed. And then on the other side of that, say, we're not dealing with that right here. Um, but there are probably other areas where we are dealing with that. Exactly. So I might not be dealing with the issue of race. Uh, By and large, you're not going to. Here. In, in York, Nebraska, although I think that, that just because of humanity's propensity toward that, that, you know, there, there are people that are here in York that are not white that experience forms of racism and we should combat that when we see it. But the injustices that happen around here are different. And so that's why I started out with that point of we need to define justice and we need to uphold justice and have a statement, not about social justice, but about what justice is and have a, a doctrinal statement Right, because that wouldn't be a reaction. That would actually just be a, exactly. a statement and then, to clarify what where we, why we're coming to the conclusions we come to on this exactly. particular issue. And if you can define justice, then you can apply justice in various contexts, whether that be race or whether that be issues of um, homosexuality or whether that be issues of uh, party politics or whether that be, you know what I mean? Um, once we, once we understand what justice is from a biblical God centered perspective, then we can talk about how that justice plays out in various aspects of life. I think that's the thing for me that's missing from this whole conversation. I, so I don't disagree with that. I, I think there's a core issue here, and it's that we are not gospel-focused people. We are issue-focused people. But that's, that's, that's the thing that's so weird to me, though, because you look at the guys that signed this thing, and there are a ton of gospel. But it's a, this is a product of the culture that we live in. We are a reactionary people. And if our focus would be on the, trans, the conversion and transformation that the gospel brings and bringing that to the world that we live in versus always we get hung up fighting with on political issues, on social issues on 
things that we disagree with instead of, okay, do we believe the gospel transforms? Why are we trying to transform and change people's minds without the transforming, converting power of the message of the gospel? So let me, let me read a couple of things from this. Uh, it says, we affirm that God created every person equally in his own image as divine image bearers. All people have uh, inestimable, I got to look that word up, value and dignity before God and deserve honor, respect and protection. Everyone has been created by God and for God. Um, and then they say, they follow that up with, we deny God given roles, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, sex or physical condition or any other Uh, property of a person neither negates nor contributes to that individual's worth as an image bearer of God. So there's a situation where they're like, okay, yeah, that's, I can get on board with that hundred percent. Why not expand on that and only expand on the statement about um, entitled uh, victims? So they expanded on that uh, in, in depth. Why? Okay. You've got a small statement there and this is where, (laughs) Keller and Mueller have a point is everybody goes to the entitled language and they yeah. don't look at what was written at the beginning of the statement. Exactly. And that's, that's why, that's that why I made. wanted to read a couple of these just to, just to make sure that we're, we're being fair here because uh, under justice, we affirm that since he is holy, righteous and good, God requires those who bear his image to live justly in the world. This includes showing appropriate respect to every person and giving to each other what he or she is due. That sounds like entitlement. Um, we affirm that societies must establish laws to correct injustices that have been imposed through cultural prejudice. So there's the, um, attack against Marxism mm-hmm. and the deconstruction of structures and laws and we, the things that we, cause I know they say we affirm that societies must establish laws to correct injustices that have been imposed through cultural prejudice. Right. So they're affirming the role of government. In this, we deny that true justice can be culturally defined or that standards of justice that are merely socially constructed can be imposed with the same authority as those who are that are derived from scripture. We further deny that Christians can live in the world under any principle other than biblical standards of righteousness, relativism, socially constructed standards of truth or morality and notions of virtue and vice that are in constant flux cannot result in authentic justice. And and here's my point. My point is those should have been the things, those two affirmations and denials should have been what this entire thing revolved around. Right. And so one more I want to read the gospel. We affirm that the gospel is the divinely revealed message concerning the person work of Jesus Christ, especially his virgin birth, righteous life, substitutionary sacrifice, atoning death and bodily resurrection, revealing who he is and what he has done with the promise that he will save anyone and everyone who turns from their sin, trusting him as Lord. We deny that anything else, whether works to be performed or opinions to be held, can be added to the gospel without perverting it to another gospel. This also means that implications and applications of the gospel, such as the obligation to live justly in the world through legitimate and import, are, are though legitimate and important in their own right, are not uh, definitional components of the gospel. Now that needs some explanation. That's my that's my point that right. I'm getting at. That's a good statement. Um, right. So the, I think the issue with the statement though is it focuses on the the social implications and the implications of things that are happening in our culture versus how does scripture, how does God address those things and how should we respond according to what he says versus expanding on all these hypothetical um, instances or things that we're reaction we're reacting to that we've seen. Yeah. It should have focused itself on here's where we stand not, uh, hey, look at this issue, look at this issue, look at this issue. We, we're going to deny that, we're going to deny that. No, here's what God says. Here's where believers should stand. That's where the statement should have. And it, I think it, it would have been signed by guys like Mueller and Keller if it would have done that. Because they, they get into, here. they said that about the gospel, and then they get into implications and applications in terms of race and ethnicity and culture and racism like so i guess to summarize because this has gone on way too long um 
my my issue is this this statement should have been a statement on justice not and social justice not social justice my view is this should have been a statement on justice that clearly delineates what justice is as defined by god and then working out the implications of that justice should have been encouraged for every christian yeah i think that i think that would have made it clear and i and i don't think i don't think that you can divorce implications and applications of the gospel from the gospel because the implications and applications of the gospel show that we believe the gospel agreed but the gospel affects every fiber of our being in every area of life not that's just my point. not just the social issues that's my point and life. so like if we if we if we are limiting and well if we're saying that this this is how you apply it in a social justice setting okay well we're missing a lot of other stuff number 1 but what about implications for justice in the gospel being focused on rather than social justice in the gospel because the implications for justice in the gospel go way beyond that they go into they go into issues that we see on an everyday basis in our lives with people around us where we see an injustice and we should stand up for justice in that case. And, and those implications of the gospel, while they are not the core of the gospel, they can't be divorced from the gospel is my point. Like you can't say, okay, here's the gospel. We uphold that. All this other stuff is separate. Like we uphold the gospel, but if you believe something, it influences how you live and it necessitates how you live in certain situations. You see what I'm saying? So I don't see how you can, I don't see how you can say, uh, like the, what was the exact wording? Hang on, let me pull it up. I don't see how you can say that, um, Anything else, whether works performed or opinions held, can be added to the gospel without perverting it to another gospel. I agree with that. This also means that implications and applications of the gospel, such as the obligation to live justly in the world through legitimate and uh, though legitimate and important in their own right, are not definitional components of the gospel. But they are they're connected necessitated the, by the gospel. Yeah, right. They're, so they're necessitated necessitated by the transformation that's happened and the reorientation of affections that's happened because of what so if so had that been in there i would have been okay with it because that's balanced this is not balanced this seems to minimize implications and applications without affirming their importance in the life of the believer you see what i'm saying yeah so anyway well this has gone 57 minutes we're gonna have to edit something out (laughs) here um anyway yeah let us know what you think uh, I'm sure we'll get some fun comments on this one. Yeah. And realize, I think when we make comments and when we talk, like you and I are talking about, about this issue from our experience and the things that we've lived through and the things that we see. There are people who live in different areas of this country that see this real social injustice. Um, I, th- I don't know how anybody could argue with it's not social injustice. It's just injustice. Yeah. I think that's the, for me, that's the big issue. Yeah. And I think, I think that really, see, we always can just uh, shorten it into <laughs> one statement by the time we're done. <laughs> it just <laughs> takes us forever to get there. Yeah. yeah so um, anyway, yeah, let us know what you think. Email us at pastordiscussions at gmail.com. Thanks to Josh and uh, Chris for jumping in on the conversation and giving us your thoughts. Um, and then you can check us out on Facebook. We have a Facebook group, Facebook page, and you can find us on pastordiscussions.com. And next week, what are we doing next week? I don't know, but we'll be back. We'll be back <laughs> with another edition of the Pastor Discussions podcast. Your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. <laughs>